Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Instagram. Hi, I am your host, Karina, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Today is going to be a great conversation about bugs. Uh, I am not a bug person, but I love to learn more about them so that I can appreciate them. And I realize that with gardening, I need pests, I need bugs. I need beneficial, I need my friends and my faux bugs, all of that. So you can't garden without bugs as much as we would like to. Um, it's not possible. We need some bugs in our garden. And so um, we are going to be talking about bugs and insects and pests and maybe, hey, what's the difference between a bug and a pest? That's one of the things we need to say. Are we calling a bug a pest? Um, I don't know. But today we have list list of pests over her uh, uh, over here you have a list of pests over here yes I me too Jean um, but uh, without further ado I want to introduce our get our guest the urban farm sister Nadia she is an animal scientist and an entomologist and I think that's super super exciting to know someone that really loves bugs and understands um, how they operate and how they're beneficial to farmers and growers. So without further ado, I am going to invite Nadia into the garden. But here's what I want you to do. Share this with your friends. Tell them to join us uh, so they can ask questions about bugs and we can learn together about insects and pests and creepy crawly things. So without further ado, let me go ahead and invite Nadia into the garden. Uh, again, you are live from the garden with your host, Karina, and Let Us Live. And every week, what we hope to do is invite you into the garden to tour inviting green spaces, urban farms, everything green that will inspire you to get out growing and cultivate your own garden. That is our goal. We want to see everybody growing something, whether it's indoor plants or it's outdoors, if it's herb, it's in your windowsill, it's on your rooftop, wherever. I think we all should consider growing something. And if you can grow something that you and your family love to eat, all the better. Uh, you can take control of your health that way. So without further ado, Nadia, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. This conversation. You're welcome. Thank you. I know I'm going to learn so much. Just stop calling an insect a bug, <laughs> a bug, an insect, a spider, an arachnid, well, whatever, all, all of that. You know, I can <laughs> stop doing that because you can teach me what I need to say and what the difference is. So, right. Uh, Yes, you all, let's welcome um, Nadia, send a wave and a hello to her. And then Nadia, introduce yourself and tell us something super exciting about yourself. Um, well, my name is Nadia Ruffin. I'm located in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, like uh, Karina said, I'm an entomologist, also an animal scientist, and just a general scientist. Um, something interesting about me, I, I've been an entomologist pretty much all my life. Um, I've always liked insects from the time I could go outside on my own and collect them. I've been doing that. So that's about four years old. Um, so I've always just interested in the insect world because it's so, you know, mysterious, but yet it's so familiar because a lot of things that we do, we actually emulate insect world, the insect world. So, um, I just go around and I teach people about insects. I also teach them about farming, uh, agriculture, the whole industry as a, you know, all of agriculture. People think agriculture is just farming, but there's a lot of different things that fall under agriculture. And so I try to educate about that. I also do research. I'm an independent researcher. Um, I do entomological as well as uh, biotechnology and, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, how to how to cultivate plants and things on small spaces, how to be farmers and things like that. So I'm all things agriculture over here. <laughs> yes, and that is so unusual in in our line of work and growing and things. It's not often that you see and I'm just gonna go ahead and put it out there. It's not often that you see an African American woman that loves bugs that can teach right. us so much about <laughs> bugs and animals because oftentimes you know 
women don't really want to be outside and we may be outside but we don't do bugs yes 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 <laughs> no I, i don't mind being outside but what i don't do is rats mice and rats we, we ain't <laughs> never gonna get along we can't be friends or anything i dropped something y'all yeah. um so okay so you're an entomologist tell us um i think because you when you and i were talking you said um around the age of four is when you found yourself really um interested in bugs that you can go as far back as you can recall is around four years old right yeah yes so yeah and when i was uh four um i used to go to my great grandmother's house and she was the one that really like honed in on my you know liking insects and stuff so every time i go to her house she would always have me a jar of all types of creepy crawlies that she found either in the house or outside. And so at four years old, I was educating her about, you can't put spiders and, and ants together because they're going to eat each other and things like that. So I just always been this like educator slash, you know, person that loves animals, insects and all of that. So it started that, at like four years old. <laughs> that is so cool. And you said something that I think is important that when our kids show an interest in something, we have to allow them to explore it. Um, yes. I think in this day and age, so many things that weren't available as a career option are now available. Just, you would never think that um, gaming, people that play games, you know, getting paid to, to play games, yeah. gaming is a professional, uh, is a profession. You wouldn't think dancing, like some people's parents, stop all that dancing and all that foolishness, but people are making a good living on dancing. And so to say that your grandmother understood that she was allowing you to nurture your interest in bugs and then fast forward, now you do bugs for as a profession and you're teaching us how yeah. to engage in bugs so quick question before we go on what's the difference between a pest and an insect is okay. it a different same thing so a pest can be it doesn't just always have to be an insect a pest could be you know a mammal like rats and mice okay. are considered pests anything that's invading human spaces that we don't want them there is what we consider a pest so it could be uh, a rat mice it could be deer raccoons they're all considered pests because they you know they come in they destroy or they carry disease and things like that so it does not just limit it to uh insects and other arthropods okay and insects is um uh, insect is an actual um order of uh you know living creatures so we have um we have insects but then we have other arthropods that they we also can people consider insects but they're not so an arthropod example would be a spider you know they're arthropods just like insects but they're not insects they have their own order they have their own characteristics and things that make them spiders but because they crawl around and you can usually find them with other like with insects people you know describe them as you know everything's a bug and there's actually everything is not a bug so all bugs are insects but not all insects are bugs um there's a whole family of <laughs> rewind that yes. all bugs are insects yes but not, but all, not insects. all insects are bugs correct so there's a family of insects called the true bugs the family name is hemiptera that's the ones you would actually call bugs so when you're talking Her about stink bugs when you're talking about bed bugs stuff like that those are actual true bugs now when people talk about ladybugs they're actually incorrect because they're actually beetles so they, they should be called lady beetles they have a whole family they're in called coleoptera which covers beetles <laughs> and so they're not bugs but because people they don't know and you know these are like uh, didn't know the layman's terms for things they just call we're them just everything. lazy we're yeah just, just say you can say we're lazy we just want to use one so uh, give me the two big words her her mift what was that a her her miftia her, her miftera are the true bugs so that's when those, are aph those aphids assassin bugs uh kissing be kissing bugs um all of these insects fall under her miftera and then her those are the ones Hemiptera, H-E-M-I-P-T-E-A-R, <laughs> Hemiptera, yes, okay. and then Coleoptera is where you, you find beetles, so a lady bug is what people normally call them, they're actually beetles, so they should be called lady beetles, okay. um, but they fall under Coleoptera, which is all the beetles, and the beetles is actually the biggest family of uh, 
actually living creatures on the planet. There's more beetles on the in the planet than any other living creature in the world. So <laughs> beetles? Beetles, yes. And they are tearing up people's gardens right now. Well, not all of them. So there's certain beetles that are, you know, defoliators where they actually feed on vegetation or they feed on roots or they feed on some type of a plant. But then there's also predatory beetles. There's some beetles that don't feed when they're adults and all types of things. So you can't lump them all together as they're tearing up. You have to know specifically which ones you're talking about. <laughs> okay. All right. You see, y'all, I learned a whole lot right then, right then and there. I, I hope you all jot that down. And, and we know now that all bugs are insects, but not all insects are bugs. Correct. Right? I get that right? Okay. That's yeah, correct. see, I learned something right there. <laughs> All right. Yeah, right. Um, and so are you, you're also uh, growing. You're a, you're also a farmer. Our connection, I think our connection is blurry. Um, I don't know if we can see you that well. You all give me a thumbs up if it's just on my end. Can you see Nadia clear? There it is. I think, well. I can see you yeah, clearly. Okay. okay, I can see you a little bit better now. Okay. okay. I can see you better. It was a little fuzzy. Um so uh, you're also a farmer, so you're growing, you grow food as well. And yes. did you s start your bug interest first or did you start your growing interest first? Um, probably the bug interest, but my family here in Cincinnati, they've always owned a flower shop ever since I was a little child. So I've always been amongst plants and flowers and things like that. Um, but it wasn't until I uh started working out in the, you know, the public sector and was learning about, you know, different diseases and stuff, because I was very interested in uh, medical entomology, but also veterinary medicine. I really wanted to go to vet school and be a veterinarian. And so for a good part of my career, I was working at uh, veterinary research as well as veterinary hospitals. And there was one position I held at, um, it was a uh, veterinary oncology. It was a uh, hospital. And we would do research, uh, trying to figure out how to, you know, cure people's pets of, of cancer. And so the pets would come in, they were getting, um, you know, radiation, they were getting chemo and things like that. And then their owners also, like, within that same week, they would have to go get their cancer treatments. And so I, I kept thinking, like, what is going on? How are the animals and the people both getting cancer? And then I realized that we're all eating the same thing. All, all our food comes from the same sources. Um, when they make pet food, they just use the scraps of whatever they didn't use for the humans. They, they put it in the pet food. And so as a result of that, we're all suffering from the same diseases, same autoimmune diseases, same cancer, allergies, and things like that. And so that's what really triggered me to, like, start wanting to cultivate my own food. And so during that same time, I created my Instagram account, and I was, you know, showing pictures of me growing things as well as, you know, insects. And it just took off from there in 2013, um, just educating people about both because they're both, you know, you can't have one without the other. Right. Um, they're all vital. Even even the ones we deem pests, I don't really call them pests because they're just doing what they normally would do. Um, we just set up an environment that was inviting to them to come in and feed. Um, but all of them play a role in the ecosystem. And so to get rid of one, you're going to affect a whole bunch of other living things. And so when you say that they all play a role in our ecosystem and our growing system, can you talk a little bit more about that and why we need to be um, mindful of the harmful ch chemicals that we use that, yes. affect, that may be killing the pests, but they're also killing some other things. Can you talk to that? And then also, do you know uh, where the – uh, where the term bug came from. Why, why uh, do we start using bug? Is there a particular reason or that just was at the beginning of time? I don't know the history around why people started calling everything bug. Um, but I, like I said, there's an actual true group of insects that are bugs. So maybe it started from there with bed bugs or something like that. Uh, okay. <laughs> people dealing with those and then everything that crawled was considered a bug. Um, but as far as the... Um, one thing affecting the other in the ecosystem. So when you have, when you're growing a plant and if you have a, what is called a, a monoculture where you're only growing one type of plant, 
you create an environment that's inviting to insects that, you know, may feed on that particular plant. But if you don't have other plants around to attract, say, predators and things that may feed on that, that insect that you're calling a pest, you're going to have a problem with that insect. So what we have to do is create like a diverse uh, ecosystem where we plant different types of plants because, you know, um, say a lady beetle, they will, they will come when aphids are there, but they need a place to lay their eggs. They need a place, uh, you know, to hide and things like that. And if you don't have that source there, they're not going to come there. First of all, they'll have their food source, which is the aphids, but then they also need places to, you know, lay eggs, live, water sources, nectar sources, and things like that. Where do so, they lay eggs? What's the ideal place for a lady beetle to lay eggs? Usually they lay them on the plants uh, that the uh, aphids are on, um, but they also have to have plants that, because some of them uh, drink nectar, or they, they need a water source and things like that. So if that's not available, they're not going to stick around. They may feed on the aphids, but they need those other things as well to... Um, allow them to stick around and be able to thrive in that environment so when you go in and try to kill aphids and say you use some very harsh pesticide that not only kills aphids but it kills anything that that's considered an insect you're going to kill them as well and you're going to kill other pollinators and things and so you cr you create a problem to where you eliminate the beneficials as well as the one that's the pest and then you have an environment that's you know just not it's not you know, conducive for growth. Um, plants rely on a lot of those insects for pollination. Sometimes they rely on insects for protection. You know, people people always get mad at ants being on their plants, but sometimes certain plants they cr they produce uh, these things called uh, nectar foliaries on their leaves that attract ants, so that protects them from insect other insects. Um, they'll protect that plant because they want that, that nectar from that foliar nectary. And so they'll prevent other insects from coming in and utilizing that. So they'll attack them. Um, Is so, that like okra? Is that okra one of the... Um, um, one of the loofah sponges are one. I don't know if you've ever grown those before. I've grown them. They're all over. I got them a whole lot of them. Okay, so there's ants always on that plant because they produce those uh, nectar foliaries. And if you turn a leaf over, you'll see this little spot... And you'll see that little nectar foliar on there. What it does produces nectar, and then they go in and they drink their nectar off of there, and then they protect the plant. So, you know, nature has created relationships with certain insects as well. Even as the pest, the pest insects, they they come up with their own plant defenses against herbivore attacks. So they create, you know, those um, you know, when plants have certain smells, they have hairs, they have thorns, they have, you know, waxy coating. All of that was for that plant to protect itself from herbivore attacks, whether it be from insects or animals as well. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, so I do, um, I do see um, ants on like beans, some of the beans that I grow on, like right now, uh, uh, purple hole peas. I see them up and down that pea. Okay. And, mm -hmm. So with with the ants, also they can also be bad because they also uh they also farm aphids. So what they'll do is they'll bring aphids to your plants. Aphids produce that same. They produce honeydew, which is when they feed on your plants, they engorge themselves with uh the plants sap because they have piercing sucking mouth parts where they stick it down into the plant and they suck out the sap. Uh, but they, they suck so much up, they get engorged and then they have to release it. And so it comes out as honeydew. And so the ants like that, again, it's just like nectar, it's sweet. So the ants love that. So what they do is they protect the aphids, but then they also take aphids to other plants and they create an aphid problem. So if you see aphids on your plants, and you see ants, the only way you're going to get rid of the ants, if you don't want the ants there and you don't want them farming the aphids, is you have to get rid of the aphids. Um, so ants can be good, but they can also be bad because they help spread aphids onto other plants. <laughs> and so what's the, um, and you, I think you said, um, did you say cinnamon? What, That's for what, ants, so right? For, yes, for ants, you can use cinnamon. Um on certain things, like say there's, they have a trail where they're coming into your house or something. I've used cinnamon in my beehives when I've had ants invade the beehives and just sprinkle cinnamon on the uh, the lids and things, and then they, they just vacate it. They don't like the cinnamon because it uh, disrupts their scent pheromones that they lay down on the ground. 
Okay, so aphid cinnamon. I mean, so ant cinnamon, and then aphids. Like, what's the is neem oil for me? I I find that neem oil does not, and it goes back to another conversation we had. Is consistently, you know, you spray one time and you think your problem is solved instead of keeping it on a on a uh, maintaining it on a regular regimen. So yes, what's a what's a one of the better ways to control aphids or get rid of them on a plant. Okay, so for aphids, um, what you're going to want to do is spray them with neem oil, um, cast out soap, and a water mixture. So it's two tablespoons of neem oil, two tablespoons of cast out soap, and a, and a gallon of water. And I would suggest to anybody that's uh, gardening, if they purchase one of these from like Home Depot or something, so this holds a gallon of water and you can mix up your spray in here and you can spray this on a lot of plants. Um, that's okay. what the sprayer looks like. But basically for the aphids, um, if the infestation is really bad, you might want to go in there and actually wipe them off. You can use like a cloth or something and wipe them off the plant and then spray. But you're going to have to be consistent with your spraying like every 10 to 14 days. Um, now, with the neem oil, it does not discriminate against insects. So you want to be mindful that you're not spraying it on lady beetles as well as uh, lace wings and other things that may be feeding on the aphids on that plant because you'll kill them as well. Um, other than that, like Early on, in the, when you were first starting to grow your plants, if you had used, like, netting over the plants to prevent insect access, this would have been the best method to use. You want to create a barrier, but if, right. you, have, if you have a problem, do, do not ever put the netting on the problem. So if you have aphids, even if you treat it, I still wouldn't go in and put this on there because what you do is you just, you just exclude all the natural predators away from them and you just give them a smorgasbord. They'll just, you know, they'll just get out of control. Um, right. But yeah, the first line of defense is always when you early on starting your gardens or your farms or whatever is to create a barrier between the insects and the plants. And then if you don't create that barrier, that's when you have to go in and do some other treatment methods. Um, also, with the, um, with the aphids, I know people go out and buy lady beetles. They'll buy them in the mail and things like that. And again, when I was talking about you need to set up an environment that's inviting to them uh, and they will come. Usually what happens when people buy those lady beetles from the internet and things, they'll release them and then by the end of the day, they all flown away. <laughs> So you I think that is money. the funniest thing. Is like you got your package, you excited, you put them on the plant, and woo, they all are gone. Next week, you they're just gone. You didn't have the environment in the first place. Yes, exactly. And so what happens with those is that they actually collect them when they're hibernating. And so once they get to you and they warm up, their first instinct is to go out, find a place to live, and then mate, and then, you know, do normal lady beetle activity. And so they're not thinking, I'm going to stay here. So sometimes people will try to, like, net them over top of, like, put a netting over top of the plants and things. And usually what happens, they're just sitting on the top. They don't know what to do. They're, like, confused. Right. And so, yeah, I was like, you know, if you create an environment, you know, the aphids are there, so they're going to eat the aphids. Um, and then if you create the environment where they can lay their eggs and all that, they'll, they'll come and they'll stay. But just to release them, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> so what um, – when – we talk about ladybugs laying eggs. What type of environment are they laying eggs in? Like what? Like what's oh. the ideal? Just where something where there's nectar on a plant? No, it's usually they usually lay it near the plants that have the actual uh, whatever they're preying on. So lady beetles are predators. They they feed on other uh, insects, arthropods, things like that. Um, so. They're going to lay their eggs near wherever there's a food source. So if it's aphids on a, you know, a broccoli plant, they're probably going to find somewhere on one of the broccoli leaves to lay their eggs, or it might be a plant right next to the broccoli plant. So once their la uh, larvae hatch, they'll crawl over to there, and they'll start feeding as well. The larvae also eat, um, um, you know, they're predatory, and they eat other insects as well. Uh, so okay. the thing with lady beetles is that a lot of people don't know what their larvae look like, and so they're always killing them. So I would advise you guys to look <laughs> look up what they look like. I have some pictures on my uh, profile and things, and I have a video and all this other stuff just to show you what the lady beetles look like. And I have video on YouTube and all that because, um, yeah, a lot of times we, you have what you need there, but you don't know what it is. 
and you need to be educated on what it is because you're killing it and it usually is something that's beneficial <laughs> yeah so um it's really hard to identify the difference between a lady beetle and a um is that a stink but what is that other red that has a red uh back on it yeah, I think it's a stink bug when they're no, 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 no. It's an I can't think of the name of the bug, but there's another bu a bug or insect that looks very similar to uh, the ladybug when they're um, you know kind of long with the black and the red back. What other bug is that? Uh, I'm not sure, but I know lady beetles. They come in a multitude of colors, and there's different species and stuff. So they're not always red and black. Their larva's not always red and black. So I have a video on my YouTube. If you guys want to watch it, it's all about the Asian lady beetle, but it talks about other lady beetles as well. Now there are two lady beetles that feed on vegetation. Uh, one of those is the Mexican bean beetle. So if you're growing beans and you see what looks like a ladybug, but it's chewed on your leaves, that is a pest lady beetle. Um, it feeds on vegetation and its larvae feed on vegetation as well. There's also a um, one that actually feeds on uh, like squash plants. So it's a squash lady beetle. Um, and again, I have those in the video so you can see what they look like. But for the most part, the others are all predatory. They feed on other things. Okay, real quick, since, we, since we're here on this part, mention your website or where people can find you. So if somebody wants to look at that um, video, we can um, okay. have them. So my uh, YouTube is um, youtube.com forward slash urban farm sister. Um, I'm also, on, of course, on Instagram. I'm on Facebook under urban farm sister and on Twitter as well. Um, I also offer a... Um, entomology course, a garden entomology course where I teach you about all the little arthropods and insects and things that you will find in the garden. And if you'd like to join that class, it's $7.99 a month. Um, it's uh, the web address is Kiwi Produce, and that's Q-U-I-W-I Produce dot farm forward slash courses. And you can go there and register. I have one for children and I also have one for adults. And it talks about, you know, the garden, uh, insects, arthropods, Right now we're going over arachnids, so we're talking about this week. We're talking about um, lady, late, uh, sorry, daddy long legs. Uh, we talked about spiders and things like that. So I'm covering all things that are not insects first, and then we're going to get into insects because there's 27 orders of insects that uh, people need to learn that may be out there. <laughs> 27. Good lord. Yes. Okay, that's a lot. But you know what? If we can figure out the bug problem inviting the beneficials then a lot of problems that you find yourself having like with the the stink bugs the aphids um the other um um gosh my mind just went squash vine boars those type of things yeah there's a way to prevent them to tour them uh, and if we learn how to garden um, what do I want to say, kind of garden sustainable, uh, sustainably, then we can kind of keep those at bay and keep the beneficials. Let me see if we have any um, questions here. Um, no questions. All right. So then um, I, you said something the other day when we were talking about the dragonfly and at the beginning of this conversation, you mentioned how nature, how we mimic nature. Yes. And I thought what you said about what the army does with dragonflies was mind blowing and fascinating. Can you talk <laughs> about that? Yeah. So the army, they actually use dragonflies and they use that to create their aircrafts, um, like hover, hovercrafts and things like that. They actually would sit and watch you know, dragonflies, they would have them in a lab. Also, they would take video and they would watch how they would actually fly. So dragonflies are one of only a few insects that can actually hover, fly backwards, fly upside down, do all these, you know, crazy different tricks that other insects can't do because they have uh, their, their wing muscles move separately of each other. And so the Army uses that to actually create aircraft. 
And so, yeah, we use insects a lot for a lot of different things. We, you know, we watch how ants and, and uh, bees and some, you know, social wasps, they actually interact with each other and they create like these systems and they build and we, we use that knowledge that we've taken from them and we've used it for our own benefit. Um, you know, it's a lot of different, like, uh, when it comes to ants, they use geothermal heating to keep their colony warm in the in the winter times and things. And we've used that technology to create geothermal heating in our homes and stuff. So we use insects a lot. We don't realize it. And, it, you know, people only think about the insects that either sting them or, you know, destroying their plants. But they're actually very... Um, they're very beneficial for a lot of different things. We use them for medicine. We use them for, you know, studies. We use them for genetic studies, all types of things. So give, give us a couple examples on medicine studies that we may not recognize because I'm fascinated. Slucky said, yeah, Slucky, I think that that's amazing, too. I would have never thought that. Like when I heard hover, and I was like, okay, it makes sense. And it's it, it we all say this as humans often, like, why reinvent the wheel? But yeah who knew yeah so, so medicine so, wise okay so medicine we actually use bees um if you ever see people go in and get stings um the bee sting actually contains uh chemicals that help with arthritis and so people go in and get stings and uh it'll actually help them you know overcome especially if they have rheumatoid arthritis and things they use them for that we use maggots we use fly maggots for uh people that have Say you're diabetic and you have a sore on your foot that won't heal. We use maggots. We also use leeches. Even though leeches are not insects, they, they still fall under that whole um, invertebrate uh, category. Um, but we use those things in medicine to help people heal that may have uh, a wound that needs to have blood flow brought there. And with maggots, they actually uh -huh. with maggots they actually go in and they'll eat any uh, bacteria that may, you know, cause gangrene and things like that. So we use maggots for that. Um, let me think some other things. I'm thanking God right now for my <laughs> health because I surely would not want to sit somewhere and have a maggot <laughs> eating out. Uh, you know, it sounds great. And I think uh, indigenous people, that is what I love about what I'm doing. I have to interject here and say this. This is what I love about what I'm doing is I get to learn from different people, different cultures, things that I would never learn just gardening and farming in my own space. But indigenous people and different people from other uh different people from other countries and d different backgrounds use those things. I, there was a PBS special where uh, they, at, when young boys get like to puberty, they let all these ants and things bite them and they're, they're supposed to so build them. So, that, so those are bullet ants. It's more of a like an endurance type um, uh, what do you call it? Oh, where they they'll put their hands in these little baskets and these bullet ants are in there. They'll let them sting it in the hand, um, and it's supposed to see if you if you cry or whatever, you're not considered a man. And so it's more like you know one of those rite of passage type things. Right. Um, it doesn't right. do it doesn't do anything beneficial as far as okay. <laughs> it's just more of a rite of passage. Okay. Um, but, but that's that's like one of the things like we use insects for multitude of different things. Um, you know, even when it comes to like uh, crime. Um, death and things like that oh they use yeah forensic entomology so there's the way that works is there's flies you know they lay their eggs at certain time intervals when uh bodies you know first person first dies or an animal first dies and then you can determine the age of the body based off what life what in star those maggots are at but then there's also other insects that show up during the de decomposition stages and so you can you can pretty much chart the time of death based off at what life stage those insects are at. Also, forensic entomology, it also covers another area people don't know um, as it pertains to food uh, food and insects that invade food are insects that develop in food. So you can, you can age food as well based off if certain insects are present or you can determine if uh, a food source was uh, contaminated after packaging or before packaging and things like that. So that's a whole area of forensic entomology that people can really get into as well. So I said we y'all <laughs> that's why you need to let your kids play with bugs. There's so yes. many 
so many different things. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's why you need to let your kids play with spiders and bugs and but don't let them come to my house playing with that stuff. <laughs> uh, that is like super fascinating. I think, you know, pray, I, I, I don't know, just how nature works. Like if we would just let it work and do what it's supposed to do, it would work, but it's not yes. working because we want to go against, against what is, is nature. And just, for example, I was thinking about the fires in Portland and, and, um, and California, and they were saying, they were put out a notice that, hey, these animals may start coming into residential areas and, and areas where people frequent because they've been pushed out of their space like out of their natural habitat so they're going to be looking for food they're going to be looking for a place to uh, keep their offspring safe right and again because we don't we don't work with nature they sometimes invade well they don't invade their, they come take their space back exactly and, and then we're upset or afraid yes and that's when we collide with them. Uh, but in reality, we came and made it what, what was rightfully theirs to begin with. Um, so, yeah, that's that's an issue. Another issue with that fire is uh, a lot of the bees now aren't, they aren't pollinating. So, oh, yeah. Because, though, that's what we use when you're a beekeeper. You use smoke to, uh, it makes the bees think there's a forest fire. So their first instinct is to go into their hive and start gorging on honey so that they, if they have to relocate, they can. And so it's all this smoke now, so it really is a forest fire. And so a lot of them are not going out and pollinating and doing their, you know, the normal processes. Uh -huh. And as we get closer to winter, especially places that, you know, might experience a cold, a cold winter or they might experience a time period when there's no flowers, they're not going out and collecting nectar now. So then their hives are going to suffer because um, uh -huh. they're, not, they're not preparing for it. All they're thinking about now is, you know, trying to find a new home to get away from this fire. So, yeah, it, it's going to affect a lot of stuff, not just, you know, people. It's affecting a lot, even down to the insects. <clears throat> wow. I didn't think about that. And so, speaking of insects, do you have any insects to show us today? you have anything? No, I didn't catch any. Um, but I was just going to talk about some insects people may have issues with right now, especially if they're growing, like, brassica plants, which are, like, the collards and the, and the broccoli. I'm pretty sure they're probably dealing with caterpillars right now as well as um, aphids, uh, flea beetles, and harlequin bugs. So I was just going to talk a little bit about what they needed to do if they had those. Okay. Um, and then also, if anybody has indoor plants and they're dealing with, because now everybody's dealing with flies in the house, and one particular fly is the, uh, the fungus gnat. So if you have plants in your house and you see flies flying around those plants, um, one thing you're probably doing is probably overwatering and what happens is these particular flies, they, they look for decaying plant matter in soil. And so your plants are, your, home, your house plants are the perfect source for that. So what they do is they lay their eggs in the soil, their larvae hatch, their little maggots, and they feed on that organic plant matter, but they will also start, go ahead. Question. Uh -huh. When you say, are we talking about gnats? Or are we talking about flies or are they the same thing? Gnats are flies. They fall on the, under the order Diptera. Uh, so those are all true flies. So gnats, uh, flies, uh, mosquitoes, and all that, they all fall under Diptera, which are true flies. Okay. Um, yes. So gnats are flies. Um, so we're talking about gnats right now. Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're talking about the fungus gnats that you find around your plants. So one thing you can go purchase from the store are these mosquito dunks, which are actually... They're good at controlling mosquito larvae and water sources that you can't dump, but they also kill fungus gnats as well. So what you would do, they also sell this in a little bit form where it's like little crumbled up little bits. Um, and you can find this at the hardware store. But if you, don't, you can't find the bits, you can always take one of these dunks and crumble it up and then water it into your soil. Um, ah. but, so what this contains is a bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis um, israelalis. So it's a back BT is a bacteria that this particular one targets um, fly larva, and so mosquitoes, mosquitoes are flies, uh, fungus gnats, and also drain flies. It'll control them, and so what you want to do is, like I said, crumble this up. It'll work for like 30 days. For the adult 
fungus gnats, you want to put these little yellow sticky traps up that you can buy off the internet, and that'll attract the adults. They're attracted to yellow. They'll stick to that, and then, of course, they can't, you know, mate anymore and lay eggs because they're stuck to that trap. But to control the larva, you want to use this. This will kill the larva. Um, so that's if you have house plants. A lot of people are bringing their plants from outside indoors now, and they're going to be dealing with not only fungus gnats, but whatever else might be living on that plant as well. So you need to treat that. Um, so question about BT. Yes. Um, so there is, uh, like, BT is the, the you get most of that in a, no, that's dimitaceous earth. Yeah. Uh, so can you do a quick, real quick overview between when the bugs that touch stuff and they die or something that goes into their um, indigestion system, like spinosad, I think that is when you use that, right? Is more of a, can so you kind of go over that? Spinosad is, is derived from a, um, it's derived from a bacteria, but it's just a toxin that they, that they synthetically made from a bacteria's own to um, toxin. So it's not really the natural source. They synthetically made it in a lab, and then you can spray it on your plants. I don't really, I don't like using spinal sac because, like I said, it's synthetic. It's not the actual real thing. Um, but with this BT bacteria, so in here, there's, there's spores, and there's also the bacteria toxin. And when you wet it, those spores will come back to life, and the bacteria will start, um, you know, dividing in the soil again. And what happens is they'll have to consume those bacteria, and it'll give them a bacterial infection, and it'll kill them. Um, mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to diatomaceous earth, that's good for things like flea beetles or, you know, uh, leaf-eating insects that are not caterpillars, and it doesn't work on caterpillars. Uh, it does work on some beetles. So uh, flea beetles are one. Sometimes cucumber beetles, it'll work on them. But basically what happens is it'll, it'll make them not want to feed on the leaves. And then sometimes if they're small enough, it'll, it has like sharp edges and it can cut them and things and kill them that way. But for the most part, it just deters feeding. Um, and then they just go somewhere else. Like they don't, they don't even want to stay on there because it, they don't want to consume those little crystals from those diatoms um, because it'll cut out their insides as well if they eat it. So they'll just, they'll, they'll leave the plants alone. Um, but these, does that like, work on the adult uh, stink bugs? No, because they don't they don't have two-way mouth parts. That's why I'm going to say. So then there's other insects that have these piercing, sucking mouth parts, which stink bugs are one of them. Aphids are another one. All the true the true bugs, the hemipterans that I was talking about, the hemiptera, they all have these piercing, sucking mouth parts. It looks like like a needle that they stick down in the plants and they suck up sap from the plants. So. Putting something on the surface of the plant is never going to affect them. So the way you have to control them is either you put the barrier up in the beginning to keep them off the plant, or you're going to have to go and hand remove them. Um, when it comes to their uh, their nymphs, their babies, you can use that, um, oh, what do you call it, the neem oil insecticidal soap spray. You can use it on the nymphs, but usually the adults have wings, so as soon as you come in there spraying, they're going to fly away. The nymphs can't fly because they haven't developed wings yet. So it'll work on the, the younger and the eggs and things like that. Um, but the adults, you can't. So it is it something like um, if it touches them, some, I, I don't know, a liquid or a powder, if it touches them, it kills them. So once you get adult stink bugs, then you're pretty much, you have them, you got to, you have to focus on um, the larva or the, the, Infant no, they, the, they, so they have a nymphal stage. They don't have larva. They have nymphs. So oh, they look, nymphs. They, yes. Um, but when it comes to the adults, it's very hard to control the adults. Number one, stink, a lot the the brown marmorated stink bug that people see a lot of out there, it, it was a, uh, an invasive species. What happened is they brought it over here on accident on some cargo ships that like took some stuff to Pennsylvania, and they started spreading from Pennsylvania like 96. So since 1996, they've been spreading across the United States. Um, so they were not an inter they were an introduced species, so they were not even native to this country. So a lot of things like birds and things didn't even see them as food. Some some mammals, some birds, and some lizards and stuff are starting to see them as food. So they're starting to get a little control over their uh, population. But before then, there was no control, and then there was nothing that you could really spray on them. Like I say, because the adults fly away. 
Mm -hmm. um, so you would have to be playing target practice all day trying to catch or, uh, you know, hit the adults. Now, people have used, you know, very harsh chemicals that, you know, may create like a, 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 a like fumes and things around, but then it also kills other stuff as well, and you don't want to do that. So um, the best thing to do is, like I say, is in the beginning, if you're going to plant something, is to use that uh, netting to prevent their access to it. And then, like, if it's something that has to be uh, pollinated, you just have to, you know, either hand pollinate or you're going to have to expose it to pollinators and then eventually close it back up so they can't access it. Okay. All right. Look, that is, y'all, yeah, I don't know about you. This was interesting for me. And <laughs> I learned a lot. And hopefully I will do better in controlling. But it, and we'll have to continue this conversation at another time. But that's why soil is important, you know, it creating a healthy plant, creating a healthy environment so that you don't have all these problems. And Jean, she says, and I think the answer is yes. Um, I, she said, can she put those uh, gnat dunks in her potting soil bag? Um, yes. Can she put, yes. I thought yeah, so. so yeah, it's the same thing if you were putting it in a pot you can use those grow bags as well you can put this in there as well just sprinkle it on the top and then water it and then let the plant dry out um a lot of a lot of this a lot of fungus net issues has to do with the fact that you're over watering and water yeah. is uh, our water is just sitting sitting around the plant and it's causing the roots and stuff to rot and you don't want that to happen um because then that will invite fungus gnats to lay their eggs in there and they'll give their larva a food source Right. Okay, you all. Guess what? 45 minutes went by that quick, and there's so <laughs> much more to talk about. But what you'll have to do is pop on over to Facebook on, on to Let Us Live, L-E-T-T-U-C-E, -T -T -E, Live. Pop over to Facebook, and we'll continue the question, question and answer, and we'll learn more about bugs, animals, pest control, and soil, and why it all works together. We have to do our part. Um, so pop over to uh, Facebook. Nadia, tell them one more time where they can find you and what you have going on and how they can support the work that you're doing. Also talk about your nonprofit. Okay. Um, so you can find me uh, again on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram under Urban Farm Sister. Um, if you're interested in taking the entomology courses as well as I have a hydroponics course coming up in October, um, so you can grow indoors and water without the use of soil, and that will also cut down on your insects uh, exposure if you're growing indoors. Um, that's also on my school website, which is uh, Kiwi Produce, and that's Q-U-I-W-I Produce dot farm forward slash courses. Um, so the entomology classes are on there as well as the hydroponics class. Uh, a little bit about my uh, nonprofit. It's called Agri Academy Inc. Uh, basically, with the nonprofit, I do research. I do entomological research as well as biotechnology and uh, automation and, and trying to use technology in agriculture. Uh, but I also do uh, community outreach where I teach about the uh, agriculture industry to youth as well as adults and try to show them different, you know, career paths they can take in, in the agriculture industry beyond just farming. Uh, and then I also help farmers, especially those that have, you know, just a little bit of land, show them how to uh, turn that into a profitable, you know, business, uh, just, you know, small scale farming. All right. So please go follow Nadia at the Urban Farm Sista, S-I-S-T-A. Uh, support yes. the work, learn more, uh, and guess what? I'm a, I'm going to take one of those classes. I need to do a little bit better. And y'all will see us getting together and doing some collaborations on yes. uh, bugs and plants. I would love to share more and talk more where uh, we can answer any of your questions. And, hey, look, if you know anybody else that we should have on the show, somebody else you'd like for me to talk to live in the garden, let me know. I'd love to have them. Tag them on here. Tell your friends. We are live every Friday. I am your host, Karina, from Let Us Live. I thank you all so much for joining the conversation. Thank you for supporting me and listening to what I talk about. I hope I'm talking about things that you enjoy, and I hope I'm bringing quality information that is teaching and that you're learning uh, something new. So remember... Every Friday, share, tell your friends, come out and, t and tag or someone that should be on here. 
I appreciate you all. You all, we're going to pop over to Facebook and continue the conversation. We're five minutes late on Facebook, so we're about to pop over there. I thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Remember, let us, let us live. Bye. See you all at Facebook at Let Us Live. See you later. Bye.